On that note, um, it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's SDC, Mr. Eric Hawkinson. Um, there was a printed introduction that I do not have with me, so it will allow him to give you his credentials himself. But I'm very excited to hear him speak, and you should be too. So let's give a warm hand for Mr. Eric Hawkinson. Good morning, Shiga. Nice and warm welcome there, thank you very much. Can we just have the lights down just a little bit? Is that okay, just a little bit? Um, so yes, my name is Eric Charles Hawkinson. Please call me Eric, no titles please. Eric is fine, just Eric. And uh, I'm gonna just take a couple of moments to just introduce myself, because first of all, it's great to be amongst Jess again. Even though you guys make me feel old, it's fine. Um, I was a Jet 2 from the year 2005 to 2010, right next door in Kyoto. I mostly taught in junior high schools. And after that, I stayed in Japan because I liked it so much. Actually, I had some experience in Japan before that too as an exchange student. But uh, through my experiences as Jet and after Jet doing research post-Jet about Jets, I'm going to talk a little bit, the key word today would be responsibility. And not only responsibility and taking responsibility, but the key takeaway today will mainly be what to do when you have a lack of responsibility, a void of responsibility. And as we go through today, I'm going to kind of set the stage with some information that may of you, you, most of you probably know but we want to just kind of touch on it to make a base. And then I want to build upon that with some kind of uh, frameworks and theories from Claire and some things happening to the JET program moving towards the future with this 2020 Olympic initiative for English competence and how that might affect us in the classroom. And then I'm going to cap that off with some connections to leadership theories that I've been working on myself to help us kind of recognize the roles that we are taking as team teachers in the classroom. Sort of the uh, who is doing what, who is taking responsibility, and sort of give us a tool to kind of gauge ourselves and so we can kind of adjust and uh, make changes in order to have the most effective relationship with each other as possible. So again, my name's Eric. I uh, really appreciate your attention for the next, uh, ooh, maybe 50 minutes or so. Oh, and we're going to have some fun too in the middle, so if I see some people starting to fall asleep, I'm going to break out an activity just to warn you. Right? <laughs> okay. So, actually I think I have a pointer. Let's see if this works. Right, so again, Eric, I first, my background is in IT. I worked for Microsoft before I came to Japan. Um, I was a late bloomer as far as college goes. I started late, and in my, that second time around in college for me, I got really interested in language and Japanese. So I came to Japan to study at Kansai Gaidai for a year, and I liked that so much after I went back and graduated. I came back as soon as I could on the JET program. And this is kind of the, the Kyoto Gaidai, the Kansai Gaidai, and then coming back on JET is kind of a, uh, becoming a common course for a lot of people uh, in the JET program as well. So, like, like I said, my background is in IT, and then when I first came as a JET, that was my first experience actually teaching. I didn't have any experience. A lot of us as JETs are the same way, but that's changing. As a move forward, there's a comparison from when I was a JET and before I was a JET, and even now, that is kind of changing towards uh, more trained teachers coming to Japan, more people interested in education coming to Japan, and uh, that's all for the better, of course. So my background is in IT. After I came back on the JET program and I was put in a place called Miyazu, which is way up north on the Sea of Japan, 
in Kyoto Prefecture. From here, it's probably about two hours by train. If you've ever heard of Amano Hashidate, it's one of, supposedly one of the three most scenic places in Japan. That was probably the, the uh, biggest sell of my position there because I could see it outside my apartment window. So I did, did mostly junior high schools there and I had a gambit, one school with 500 students and at that time, this school is no longer present, but I also taught at a school, a junior high school, with six students, between three grades. <laughs> so, <laughs> I went into a first grade class with one student, <laughs> and two teachers. <laughs> and you go down to the office and there would be more staff there, of course, than teachers. That, that school is closed, I mean, we can, I can, I don't want to go into the politics of having to shut down classrooms, and of course Japan has the rural uh, problem and the urbanization of Japan and the aging of Japan, and all those issues are very apparent in the upper parts of northern prefecture as well. But, um, so yeah, I had to run up the gambit as far as class sizes and class situations there. So hopefully that, sort of, that started to inform me of like what kind of relationships are forming between me and the JTEs, and how can I make this better? And I did, started a bunch of programs. I got a lot involved in community efforts, which is partly one of the reasons why after I left JET, I was offered some positions teaching at high school and ultimately I teach now at Sebi University. Um, that is going to be, it's a private university now, but it's going to be a public university starting next fall. It's going to be called the University of Fukuchiyama. And there I teach course English, but I also teach uh, digital literacy because of course I have an IT background and my research area is learning technology, educational technology. So I'm developing e-learning websites and how to make them most effective for learners, developing applications on smartphones to have this uh, sort of flipped classroom environment, Hante Jugo, right? So you can watch videos before coming to class, and so we can use the class time for actual discussions and activities and things like that. So those are some of the projects you see up here on the, on the screen. If I have time later, I'll plug them. But uh, just briefly, orientation is a program that uh, I started to use augmented reality in the classroom. It's a, kind of a new technology, and I've been designing textbooks around this technology. Forever Kyoto is a project I started to study uh, tourism, and uh, most importantly, how information from English users like Jets and other people gets spread to other countries as far as tourist information and how people learn about Japan through things like social media. And I get my students involved in this a lot too. It's one of the greatest things for them because they want to show the world uh, things around their neighborhood, around Japan, and this is a way for them to communicate their uh, love of their home area to the world. <coughs> Team Teachers is actually something I started on the JET program because I noticed there was a need for us to be able to exchange our materials. And I started this because there, at conferences like these, they, was, they were collecting this in Kyoto Prefecture. I don't know how they do it here in Shiga, but they would collect uh, materials from us in paper form every year, and they would Catalog, catalog it in the office, and they still have this huge area room with all these materials there. But it's a little bit multi nine because there's that to get at that is very difficult. So I started this program to help us kind of get things on the web and to exchange this uh, freely and fully. And since I've been on Jet, this kind of activity has increased, and we can see this almost in every prefecture now. And the last one is uh, T Together Learning Center, where it's kind of a sandbox where anyone and everyone can kind of log in and sort of experiment with your own e-learning or blended learning classroom. That means using the internet and the classroom experience together in one kind of environment. So kind of supporting what you're teaching in class with some materials like on YouTube or, or making them post blogs on and write about their experiences, and then in the classroom you can kind of uh, reflect or project into the future and sort of bring everything together. So that's a little bit about me. Um, towards the end, 
if we have time, we can uh, open up for questions about me and about what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, let's start with a simple question. And there's two words up on the screen, and that's team teaching and co-teaching. And before I start to explain it, why don't we just t take 30 seconds and turn, well, right, right now, why don't you just look at the person next to you and say hi. <laughs> okay, so that person that you just said hi to, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong or if you know about these terms, just take 30 seconds to discuss what these terms are, team teaching and co-teaching. How are they different? Which one's uh, more predominant? And which one do you think is maybe even better for an, a learning environment for your students? Is that okay? She. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't you go ahead, 30 seconds, try it. Is there anything? Yes, up here. Um, I think team teaching sounds maybe more um, effective, like more impactful than sort of co-teaching. I think it makes like a new sort of entity in the classroom than two separate parts. So in your mind, co-teaching is two separate entities and a team is more Con con concise more together. Okay. I mean, from the terms, yeah, it's definitely something that we can uh, derive from it. Just looking at those terms, I think I agree with that. Is there any anything else? Okay. So actually, <laughs> way, way in the back here, there's uh, one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So just going off from that, I would say yeah, team teaching might involve more planning together, whereas co-teaching is just being in the classroom together, but maybe the planning or that process is initiated solely by one person. And we were saying that maybe it's, team teaching is kind of what the gold standard for a lot of the JET program kind of things, but it isn't necessarily always a good thing. Like if you have one competent teacher who has a clear vision of what they want to do, then in some ways it can just be an inefficiency to have uh, too much like redundant discussion and planning about it. If one person has a clear plan and can work to that vision, then actually the other person can just play that supporting role. Excellent, thank you. Those are excellent comments. And actually that goes towards the theme that we have today, because you mentioned maybe one person taking initiative, taking dominance, taking lead, taking responsibility, that buzzword today. And that has a lot to do with the, the key, the terms up here as, far, as well, because um, in a team, the team teaching, as far as uh, research and literature goes, has been around a long time, as far as JET program. But the co-teaching idea, compared to team teaching, is relatively new. And it came out of special education, where there was a necess necessity for someone in the classroom at all times understanding these physical and mental conditions of students, as well as some sort of uh, subject matter expert and they needed to work together for the best teaching environment of the students. 
And the team teaching is a more broad, more uh, flat type of uh, term, and it's more loosely defined. It's more defined in different ways, actually, because of this has been around longer. But like this gentleman up here said, team teaching doesn't necessarily spread the responsibility equally. There could be, for example, on a basketball team, the Scott, the star point guard, and all the supporting cast around that person, but they are still a team, and without the rest of the team members, even though there's the star point guard in education, we might call him the sage on the stage, and the other people are the supporters in the corner. Um, in the team teaching environment, both are important, and I would argue equally important, uh, to have both of those terms. But in the co-teaching world, they're sort of moving towards this shared responsibility. They both have a equal stake in the outcomes, the learning outcomes of their students. They, they both have equal responsibility about the, the grades that their students receive, the care that their students receive, and the progress their students are making. So really the biggest difference here is a team is all working together, they have different roles, different levels of responsibility, and in co-teaching, they really try their best both to own it and be responsible as much as possible. And it's in my opinion, as far as us team teachers, that the environment for us students starts to rise for our, as we start to take more responsibility and together uh, try to own up to what's happening and the outcomes of our students. And today I'm going to try to work in some ways that we can try to work towards this co-teaching environment. Great, so let's start with some data and the beginning of the JET program. So what I got behind me here is I want to talk about the idea of responsibility versus authority. And they're mainly they're related but different ideas, right? So to have the authority to be a leader is different than actually taking initiative and doing it being a leader. There, there are two different ways to go about it. And as far as us JETs are concerned, this is data from 1991, there was a very low percentage of people entering the JET program with teaching experience. Like myself, I didn't have any teaching experience. I just had my other skills, my IT skills, my I was going to say charm, but I didn't want to go that far. <laughs> but um, this is starting to change, and we can see this in our team teaching environments because as we st start to get more authority, we, st we have more stake in our team teaching environments. Uh, the we start to move towards this co-teaching type of environment a little more. Um, I guess we, I can ask this question. Can I just see? Uh, from the JETS. Uh, how many of you came on the JET program either with teaching experience or with some sort of teaching certification? That's a lot. So, yes. Just by the show of hands, there's a, so I don't know how many of you are ALTs and JTs in the room, but just by that raise of hands, even compared to when I started JET in 2005, that was, that's increasingly uh, dramatically changed, changed for the better. So as we start to get more authority, of course, more authority wants and kind of desires more responsibility in the classroom. And this becomes both a good thing and a bad thing, because as both teachers gain more authority, they both want more responsibility. And that sometimes can make some conflict as far as like, which direction should we should go. So this gentleman over here mentioned before, like there could be one person with some some vision, some goals, some great thing, and everyone gets behind that person, and they start moving towards that goal together. That's great, but if you have a couple of people with some uh, knowledge and some authority behind them, and they have different opinions, that could stall out the situation in the classroom completely. Jets. We were on the rise until 2003, and when I came in 2005, we started dipping down. And now we're moving right back up again. And three, maybe five months ago now, uh, Prime Minister Abe came out and he said he wanted to double the amount of ALTs coming to Japan. And because there's this move towards, even when I was in, on the JET program, 
We want English competency, communication skills, but there's always this mixed message, and I'm sure it's kind of an elephant in all of these rooms. In that same speech, President Abe told us that he wanted to make a minimum TOEFL score for admission to any public university in Japan. So these are kind of mixed messages, or again, with the vision, the authority that I'm talking about too. These are starting to rise in conflict. But as we're moving forward here, we're starting to rise up. And one of the reasons is, is this new initiative. Uh, it started, it, I think it was birth, I think. Uh, one of the other teachers, Ben, might know a little bit more about this if you're in his workshop later today. You can ask him about it. But uh, it's the English Competency 2020, and it's kind of aligned with the Olympics. And it was birthed at the last Olympics. Uh, and it's partnered with uh, some people in the British Council. Is anybody here from the British Council today? I think they had they were involved with it this session, maybe sometime before. But they're doing a lot of the stuff. They want to change a lot of the training, a lot of the ways that JTEs are being trained, moving towards the future, more English-based. And for JTEs, that means more of you, and it means you're going to get some standardized training, hopefully, and some, maybe even some standardized materials as far as team teaching environments goes, because we don't really have any of that as of yet now. But I'm cautiously optimistic, of course, about this, because there it seems to be these initiatives coming out with not necessarily frequency, but they've come out since the JET program has started these, these sort of initiatives. Right, so team teaching. Let's kind of set the stage very simply. Uh, we have our ALT and our JT. So in, the, in this room, I just want to know who you are and where you are. Could ALTs please raise your hand? Most of you, my goodness. Where are the JTEs today? <laughs> There's a couple. Uh, JTEs please raise your hand. Oh, okay. More of you in the back. <laughs> um, as far as the ALT goes, how many of you are first year? In the front? Mm -hmm. That's going to come out a little later as we move along in this talk here. For second years? A little bit more in, towards the back. Okay. A couple in the front here. Third years? There's a couple in the back. Okay. And fourth years? Yeah, way in the back. And is there any fifth years? Hey there, fellow unicorns. There's mostly in the back. So I noticed that there's this, this, the first years kind of, there was a big uh, change there, right? In the front, our first years, and in the back, in the back we have our more experienced. And that goes along with this leadership theory that I'm trying to apply to our team teaching environments. That was, that was great. So we have AFT and JTE. So, uh, Let's just move on from that. We have four styles. Most of you know this. I'm going to try and quickly go through them just so I can set the stage for this leadership theory that I want to talk about. So we have the first style, which is very prominent in the classrooms when ALPs are not present. I like to call it the chalk and talk approach. It's lecturing, something on a, put writing something on a board, and explaining the grammatical constructs behind the language and uh, explaining what goes into making a sentence, the structure of it, and then practicing it usually through uh, some sort of self-centered or student-based uh, activity like doing a worksheet or writing uh, an essay or something like that. And uh, in this situation, uh, I've heard this, this happened to me a few times on JET, of course, too. We turn into a human tape recorder where the majority of the lesson is based towards the content of the structure of the grammar, and we are there to help the students actually just say what's in the content of that text or that passage or whatever grammatical situation we're there. And uh, so when I talked about authority, if this person here has authority and is doing this role, they might feel a little bit frustrated, right? So why do AOTs, why do you want this? You're used to this, and you have a lot of responsibility. A lot more than we do as Jets. So you have the responsibility for the weight of them to be able to get into that. 
good school next coming up, to be able to do well on that test, to be able to answer to parents that are very concerned for their children, and for uh, the students to be able to uh, be able to move and be able to do the best they can as well moving into the future. So that means they need to prepare for their GCAN, right? So it's this style, this, this approach to teaching, I, I, first of all, I like to say that none of these are particularly good or bad. They're just different. And uh, they all have their good points and their bad points. And if you want to prepare for the test, this usually is the most effective because you can introduce test questions, you can break them down because a lot of these tests are so nuanced in the way you have to answer them that, that uh, you kind of have to study specifically for it. And this kind of teaching, of course, uh, if it is more broad, more communicative, it's less likely to be lasered in on the kind of content needed for the test. And of course, this kind of approach is kind of not so good as far as getting that English communication competency that we all want for our students. Now, switching the roles, now the, the dominant was the JLT, and we have when the Jets are doing most of the, taking most of the responsibility in the classroom, um, I call it a happy fun time because a lot of us, especially when I started, it's like, well, uh, the, the non we kind of thing when it happens to some of us Jets, anything is okay, we come up with some sort of activity. We want to get the students up. And I'm still a big predominant of this style of learning, actually. I'm trying not to interject my own opinions about this, but uh, it's a big buzzword in higher education in Japan now. I've been kind of with it a long time. Active learning, learning by doing, the sort of constructivist uh, pedagogical approach where we learn by trying it, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and changing it in our minds. And, of course, we make some games, and I made a ton of them uh, during my stint on the JET program, and I put them all up on the uh, website. It's kind of, I think, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to start to go a little bit faster. So, this gets the students motivated. Right? They get, they're having some fun, they're, getting, they're moving their body, um, they're getting energized, motivation towards English. But uh, it might not be able to be on the curriculum or on the scope or on the pace that's needed for that test or needed to fit in the overall curriculum um, in, the, in your schools or in your districts. There was, of course, there is, of course, in every district and in Japan as whole, a guideline for teaching English and what we should be doing and what needs to be learned down to the minute details. But not a lot of Jets know this. Is there? Has anyone read the Momokagaksho handbook? On, here's one person up there. Wow. Congratulations, sir. I never read it. I, I, I perused it. But my, my, my Japanese level was, I read like a three-year-old when, when I so it would have taken me years to get through that. But, you know, of course I asked my JTEs uh, what's going on in this section uh, coming up in the next few weeks. Um, what are we supposed to be teaching? So this, I tried my, my best, in my experience, to try and engage these so-called happy fun time environments, these active learning environments towards the curriculum itself. And during today, I'm going to kind of interject some of the studies I've done and some of the data I've collected uh, over the years. And I'm not necessarily going to talk about where I got it because that would take a long time. But I will have a bunch of references, and some of them are actually on the handout you received earlier. So if you want to look at the papers I've written on this and you want to see the data in its full form, you're able to do that on your own. So this is some data from a entire school district, um, and we want to find out we, from the students how they're interacting with ALTs and JTs. And in the green here, they're saying that they're using Japanese with both of their teachers. And the red is, is they're using J 
Japanese with their JTE, and they're trying to use English with their ALT exclusively. And the blue is they're trying their best to use English at all times during team teaching lessons. And we can see there's a jump, of course, because the, the, most of the students are using Japanese exclusively in this district. And some are using English with their ATs in the elementary level. But of course, this is, this is, the language is being introduced for a lot of these students at this stage. So I feel like this is natural. And this jumps when they go to the junior high school level. So this kind of approach kind of fits back into the uh, ideal of, because a lot of JETs are taking responsibility in this, and mostly more in elementary schools than in junior high schools. I don't know if, it's for, if that's for a lot of you, but that means that it is incumbent on many times the ALT to try to get this down and it's also incumbent on JLTEs to try to encourage uh, the English use, not just when the ALTs are there, but when they're not. Now we want to combine these two. It's kind of like a tag team. So this is when we're starting to move towards this co-teaching environment, right? So first we had one person with the responsibility and authority, and the second we had the other member with it. And now we're just kind of sharing time. We're taking the first half of the lesson and doing some chalk and talk. We're introducing a grammar point. We're showing some passage in a book or a, uh, um, from your textbook. And then that gets handed off to the ALT where they take that information and do some sort of activity around it. And when I was at the ALT, a lot of my experience did this. And I made a lot of games, put them up on that. Uh, teamteachers.com website. So you get to learn it and then use it. That's a great uh, thing to remember in your English. You use it. Uh, this is that term. If you don't use it, you lose it in language. And um, the interaction is not as well as a lot of people would want between the teachers because basically we're saying we're studying this. I'll have such and such time. You have such and such time. And that's all the real planning you need, basically. And if you can go, you can go deeper, of course. But to do this type of environment, the interaction between us, AOTs and JTEs, can be minimal and ends up being minimal a lot of the time. So then we start to move towards this co-teaching environment. What does that look like? That basically means that students are unaware of who is the main direction of the course. It's ambiguous as to who is in charge in the classroom, who is actually doing the, the push towards the, the, what's going on in the classroom, and uh, who, who is actually having the responsibility of uh, the goings on, the activities, and the lecture and the information being delivered in the classroom. So this is a balanced approach. But this takes a lot of time with us, JTEs and ALTs, interacting together. Uh, a lot of time that we don't have, in many cases, unfortunately. And uh, because, it, especially with the, what I'm going to talk a little bit earlier, with the first years, they need more direction, a little bit more uh, experience to start being able to interject more into the environment in which they, that they have been placed. So they need a little bit of time, especially in their districts, or where they are in the classrooms, to start to understand how they can contribute, how they can take more responsibility. So this takes a little bit of time, uh, maybe even a year or two, to start to kind of see this sort of environment in the classroom. So we have the four talks again, the chalk and talk, AAT directed, tag team, and we want to start to move towards this joint directed approach. I just put some pictures in. So this is directly out of our, the, the Claire handbook for team teaching. Has anybody read the handbook for team teaching? There's a couple of people here. Um, this was made in 2013, and you'll notice that there are some parallels between the four styles of teaching 
and this diagram here. And in this diagram, we have our, in the top corner here, the, the, the chalk and talk. And now we have, it says the JTE is the dominant character. They're taking their responsibility. And the ALT is the supporter. And down on the other side, uh, this, this author called it a culture class, but I called it happy fun time. I don't know. There's a difference in, maybe a difference, but uh, this is where the ALT is dominant and the JTE is the supporter. So we have different sages on the stage, different supporters in the corner. And the pedagogical approach, like I said before, starts to differ as far as who is doing the, taking on the responsibility, taking on the lead. And in many cases, the communicative approach is, is uh, preferred by the ALT and the chalk and talk approach by, the, that's not all cases of course, but uh, in many cases we see that. But what happens when both teachers are wanting to be the supporter in the corner, or both teachers want to be the sage on the stage? This is where we start to see some problems in the relationships between both parties in the classroom. Because if both people want to be a supporter, they're not taking initiative, you kind of have a stalling situation happening. Uh, nothing's being approached, nothing's being done. Uh, sort of like the, um, both are taking the non demoe approach, anything's okay. And both are looking to each other to have some direction, to have some goal, to have some meaning into the classroom. And on the other end of that, when both teachers have a clear vision, they have some uh, some authority behind them. They have some uh, goal that they would like their students to have. We might have some conflict as far as whose idea and whose way of going about the classroom is actually done. So I wanted to, I, I started thinking about that in 2008 as a teacher and I did a workshop. I was going to have a couple workshops later today and this was on this whole idea and I made this uh, matrix. Uh, to kind of start thinking about how these pedagogical approaches changes as far as who is doing the directing and who is doing the, um, the kind of the supporting role and what that means for our relationship as teachers and what it means for the learning of our students. And basically it's what I talked about, the four uh, approaches that I just mentioned, but I put them in a matrix form and that's going to come connect that to the next thing, which is, uh, I'm in the middle of my PhD candidacy, and I spent a lot of time two years ago and a little bit last year thinking about leadership in education. And one of the things that I've noticed with the matrix that I worked on in 2008 is that this theory called situational leadership starts to meld and match very well with this type of uh, idea, this matrix. And situational leadership theory basically states that there is no one way to lead a company, no one specific way you sh should always be running your classroom. There's no one way to be a leader. You have to adapt to the situation. And this theory tries to describe different situations and what kind of leaders work best in those situations. So that's why it's called situational leadership. So we have, uh, oops, there's two axes on this matrix. There's four sections to it too, which is very convenient. And we have directive behavior, which is the uh, one-way communication, the telling, the authority type of uh, thinking. And on the other axis, we have supportive behavior, which is more two-way communication which is more of the, the supporter in the corner type role. And that kind of also forms four quadrants, directing, coaching, supporting, and delegating. And they name these and they have different uh, stages and they kind of go along with this S, the numbers here, S1, 2, 3, 4. And that matches up with the developmental level of the people involved. So in, this is not necessarily geared toward team teaching, but it's geared toward leaders, perhaps at a company or a business, trying to lead a group of people. 
So you have in the first section, directing, where you have, you're telling everybody great detail, a lot of one-way communication to either your employees or in our case, our team teaching partner, telling them great detail, what to do, how to do it, and then giving them a little support and letting them try it, do maybe even failing from time to time. And this goes with the uh, developmental process of how we start to gain experience and authority in our positions. So when you start, you have low competence and high commitment. And that was represented earlier today because our first years were all up front. <laughs> not necessarily, I'm not just saying you're low competence, but you have the, uh, the high commitment, the initiative to seek, seek some information to get more knowledge to be better at what you're doing because you're new and you're maybe a little bit unsure about what you're doing. You're maybe uh, seeking a little bit more authority, you may be seeking a little bit more uh, responsibility in your classroom. So you have that drive. And as we start to move up the scale here, D1, D2, so low to some competence, and your commitment starts to, to falter a little bit, and then moderate to high competence, where your commitment starts to vary, you start to have some successes, have some failures, and you're so you're starting to kind of figure your way into this position, this role, what you're doing. And at the end, you have confidence in what you're doing because you've failed a few times, you've succeeded enough to where you feel like you can do your job well and do it right. So now you both have high competency and that drive, the initiative, and the commitment. So this is connected to how we want to approach your Partner. So if they're new, oops, sorry, according to this theory, we want to, for the uh, people that are new, that have high uh, initiative, high drive, we want to give them detail about what to do and how to do and when to do it, and let them try. Go try and do it. Let them fail. Let them try it out. Because they have all these initiative, we might not have the time to actually, uh, I hate to use the term handhold, or uh, be there to support every situation because they need to try things out and basically maybe even fail once or twice to start to gain experience so they can have the authority. And as they gain authority, you start to change your approach to how you deal with that partner or employee. So the coaching aspect of it is when you're still doing that one-way communication, the next stage of this actually, but you're starting to give uh, a little more two-way communication as well. So now this person, this employee, this partner in our team teaching environments has had enough experience to have some meaningful questions. They want to know, as for in our situation, what's the situation with these particular students? Uh, what's going on with our curriculum? How am I doing as far as um, the things that I'm doing in the classroom? Uh, melding with what's going on in the school as a whole. So then we start to need a little bit more both directive and supportive behavior. This is when we start to need to answer these questions. We need to, uh, maybe they've had some difficulties, so we need to sort of uh, do some uh, consoling, maybe, from once, once or twice. And then we start to move on from there. After we've kind of reached, the, this is sort of like a pinnacle into the process of uh, competency. So we start to move away from directive, because now you're starting to know more about what you're doing, your job. So you don't need to be told anymore exactly what to do, how to do it, when to do it. So then you start moving away from your directive behavior and just becoming a supporter. So now you're basically saying, this is what happened in, for in my situation, the, when I talked about the tag team, we, we, we have this grammar on this day, Oh yeah, okay, I got this, you have this, let's go. So the, I didn't need to be told we, from this time, please do this, this, and that. I just got told the very basic minimum information and I was let to make the rest of the lesson on my own. And then the final stage of it is the high, both low directive and low supportive. So then when this person has complete competency and, and drive, they don't need to be told what to do because they have the drive the initiative to do it, and they have the experience and authority to carry out the job themselves. So 
how you, how directed you are, and how supportive you are, is very important, according to this theory, depending on where you are in your development, in your job, in your situation. So let's connect that to team teaching. And I wrote a paper about this last year, and I came up with, this is a matrix that's actually in your handouts, and I've taken this situational approach and kind of melded it with the uh, matrix, the four styles of team teaching that we had before. Now, <clears throat> this is meant as a framework, it's meant as a tool to help us gauge where we are in our own developmental process so we can kind of figure out what kind of, uh, how much directive we should be, how directive we should be, how supportive we should be, how much initiative we, sh we should be taking. And this is meant as a tool to kind of not only just adding another dimension on it because the leadership theory is looking at one leader and the employees, but now we're looking at basically two leaders working in conjunction. So now we start to see this paralysis this two authorities uh, clashing with each other and the two uh, pedagogical approaches when one person takes on authority and the other one doesn't. So we have our directing down here. So this person is doing all the planning and it's depending on who's doing the planning that the pedagogical approach is different. So it could be the happy fun time or it could be the uh, chalk and talk, but depending on who's doing, who's in authority and what kind of style they prefer. And on the other side of it, up here, one person might be new, might be wanting to be the supporter in the corner, and one person has enough authority to be that stage on the stage, and because that one person wants to be the supporter, the other person is kind of, not necessarily forced, but is relegated to take on that uh, leading role, and therefore the same thing happens again. It either gets pushed towards a happy fun time approach or a chalk and talk situation. Again, depending on who's in authority and what style they prefer. And then both directive and supportive, we start to get towards this co-teaching uh, environment where both teachers have more of a two-way communication and they're supporting each other and directing each other at the same time. This means that uh, not only are they telling each other what to do and how to do it, but they're helping each other improve. They're working together in this whole process. So, but as we see in the stage here, this in the developmental process, right? This is a sort of kind of in this theory, it's sort of tied to where you are in your developmental process. But in, as far as team teaching goes, it's more about where you are in your development as into working together. So this kind of works in a, almost a separate fashion where in the beginning we have one of these and then we start to split going one way or the other depending on what kind of teachers that you work with and the situation that you're teaching in. So how I'd like you to try to use this, how to think about this, is before you maybe even begin a team teaching lesson, doesn't matter if you're a JTE or an ATE, sort of look at this matrix and sort of think about what, where am I at in my developmental process and how supportive and how uh, take charge, how much authority do I need to exhume in this classroom to have the most effect for my students, for your students, for our students. And what works best in most situations is this sort of synergy, right? Because like again, we don't want too much authority on both ends where we have some sort of uh, conflict between the teachers and we don't want no authority taken because then we have sort of this stalling effect. So what you do, you can use this also not for yourself, but for your partner. You can look at your partner's level in, of development and see how much authority that they are willing and able to take. And therefore you can start to change your behavior, change your way, change how much direction and support you want to give in order to have some uh, symbiosis, some matching. So for example, if we have one AT, you notice your AT or JT wants to direct, you might move a little bit towards the supporting act, 
on a stage to get some more synergy in the classroom. Uh, if, of course, you're not in the uh, far along in the developmental process, but if you're both uh, have experience together and have worked together, then you can start to move towards this team teaching where you're both exuding authority, you're both supporting each other at the same time. Okay? We with me so far? That was kind of a lot of talking, wasn't it? So let's wake up. Let's wake up. All right. So what I want to do now. <laughs> We're going to do some thumb wrestling. We're going to wake up. There's some people up there I see sleeping already. No? No, maybe not. Okay. But how much time do we have? This, i got 20 minutes? Huh? 13 minutes. Oh, my goodness. All right. Let's do some thumb wrestling quick. Um, so this is, has two purposes. Basically, I want you to think about the team teaching matrix as we do this activity. How supportive are you being? Because uh, actually you're gonna have a chance to do this more fully in, a, in depending on what workshop you're in. If you're in Martin Stack's workshop, we work together to sort of integrate this in so you can uh, kind of reflect and see this theory in action a little bit more. But as we do this today, I just want you to kind of be aware of your own way of approaching and being able to get the job done. And the job today is we're all going to connect in one big node and have some thumb war. We're going to have some thumb war. Everyone's excited, right? No. <laughs> um, I'm a big proponent of TED. I work with TEDx Kyoto. I'm director of interactive there. I don't think I mentioned that before. I'm a huge fan of TED, and I think TED is great for English education. There's TED Ed groups. If you're interested in that, please contact me on how to get involved in showing TED talks to your students. There's over uh, 50,000 TED talks, TEDx talks online. You can get involved with TEDx Kyoto uh, just down at uh, the uh, University of Kyoto, Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. I actually teach part time there as well. And this is a great thing for English education as a whole. But this is a Jane McGonagall. She's a game-based learning expert, which I love. I love this type of learning because I was talking before, the happy fun time approach, right? So she has devised this way for people to team build in a very short amount of time. It's multiplayer thumb wrestling. And it's not just the, the one person and the one person I, how many, how many people have actually played Thumb War in their life? Okay, most of you. So this is multiplayer Thumb War. It's a little different. You're going to connect as many hands as possible to, um, to try and win a battle. So, and you don't want one hand free either. You don't want one hand free. So you're going to try and connect uh, three or four hands together with one hand and then kind of reach over and try to grab somebody else and uh, do another hand. Now, usually in thumb war, when you pin somebody down, you're the winner. But because there are multiple people in your node, or the first person, this is the game of speed. So the first person to get another thumb wins. And that's over. So you have two hands, you're supposed to connect to two people. You can concentrate, it's, let me tell you, it's difficult to concentrate on both. So you try to usually maybe one or the other, or have some other strategy you can try to think of. But as soon as one battle is done, you try to finish the other. And uh, basically, if you win both, you're a grandmaster. You consider yourself a grandmaster of thumb wrestling. If you win one, you're uh, a legendary, I think, oh sorry, legendary status for the both, and the grandmaster if you win one. And what we want to do now for the next maybe two minutes, is just, let's start by everybody, please stand up. <laughs> Number one, please be aware of how you're connecting to people around you. Number two, we have to have our, our goal, as in goals in educating our students to English, our goal in the group is to connect every hand in this room. How many people do you have here? We have maybe 150, so 300 hands connected in some fashion with other people in the room. So how you work that out is up to you. 
how you connect your hands to other people is up to you, but I want you to be aware of how you're taking initiative and how you're directing it with other people around you. Somebody's taking the lead. Now I'm going to try to support it. So this is what this whole idea is about. It's, it's about situational leadership, adapting to the situation around you and changing your approach, changing your style to best uh, facilitate what's going on in the classroom. All right, so was there any legendary masters in the audience? There's one. Legendary. Legendary. Man, you are 
killing it today, sir. Yeah. As always. <laughs> <laughs> You can actually look it up online if you win both hands. You are official. You are a legendary thumb war uh, grandmaster or something like that. So, you know, like I said before, if you're in Martin's workshop, you get to work through this a little bit in general. I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to quickly run through a couple of these things. I have a whole thing that I wanted to go through today to give you some practical things to go into this whole supportive and directive thing, and I call it the chime in. It's uh, sort of just these tips, these uh, tools we can use to sort of move towards this uh, co-teaching environment where we're either doing more supporting when we need to or doing more directing when we need to. And that has to do with before and after classes, and I had some data look every lesson. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any of this, I'm sorry. Um, basically, there are three stages of it. You can think about what's going on before the class and how supportive you need to be, how direct you need to be. During the class, you can kind of judge just like what we did with Thumb War Wrestling, uh, how supportive you need to be and how direct you need to be. And these are some tools that we can use. And actually, I think I have, thankfully, I think I put this into your handout so you can look at this at your leisure. It's the last part of the handout. All these simple tips, all these simple ideas that we can do in our team teaching environments to help us move towards this team teach, uh, co-teaching environment. Uh, da, da, da. I'll just move to the very end here and do some final remarks. References, if you want them, I have them online too. Like I said, if you want to see some of the data, if you want to see some of the papers I've written about this, all you have to do is contact me. Uh, if you want to get involved with the projects, of course I can't talk about them in any more detail, we run out of time. But if you want to know more about them, you can contact me as well. Uh, my homepage, my email, it's all in that handout. Uh, Facebook, please find me online and be my friend. I want more friends, <laughs> especially in Shiga. And uh, again, if you want to get involved in any of those projects, if you have an interest in, especially in technology and education, I have a bunch of projects, and if you, if you want to get involved with them, please uh, contact me about that. If you have any questions about this team teaching matrix idea, and you might want to use it in your classroom a little bit more, I can send you a copy of the paper I've written, if you think it might be helpful to you. And if you just want to say hi, I'd really appreciate that too. I'm going to be uh, here until the afternoon. I have to go teach classes in the later afternoon. But I'm going to try to make myself available after this for direct conversation with you. If you might have any questions or you just might want to say hi, I'd be really happy and excited to get to know you a little bit better. And how are we doing on time? Almost finished? Great. I uh, just want to take this last minute to say thank you for being a great audience. You guys were awesome. It was great talking to you today. I hope that you can, I hope I said something that was useful. That was a whole goal of course today, right? And uh, if hopefully this information can help you kind of just reflect on yourself, reflect on your partner, and sort of, sort of try and get our relationships improved for our students moving towards the future. So again, my name is Eric uh, Gosecho Okini. <laughs>